Welcome to Cost Control and Governance at Scale. My name is Bina Khimani and I lead product management for cost optimization in AWS. This includes services like AWS Cost Explorer, AWS Budgets, Cost Anomaly Detection, and many other services that help you better manage, predict, and optimize your spend on AWS. With me today, I have Caitlin DeCrain. She's Senior Cloud Financial Manager at Morningstar. Caitlin leads the Morningstar's FinOps practices, and she's going to share some of her learnings with us today. In her four-year journey at Morningstar, she has been establishing this governance and control at scale, and we will see how they have implemented that. Now, that's a little bit about me. Let me introduce you to you. This session is really for particularly anybody who cares about cloud cost across the organization. You could be a part of Cloud Center of Excellence or Enablement Center, or you could be a part of finance team or a procurement team. You could very well be a builder or an application owner who is trying to make the cost of your architectural choices. Whether you are a business leader, technical leader, or finance leader, this session will provide you the tools and practices that will help you optimize your cloud spend. We have a lot of good contents to cover today, and we will dive into three specific areas. First of all, how do we really establish the basic guardrails in place to ensure that we are not slowing down the builders, but we are also making sure that our costs are in line with our broader financial and business goals? Second, how do we avoid any billing surprises? The speed of innovation and the agility are critical to business. At the same time, no CFO is comfortable with any kind of billing surprises. And finally, we will learn from Caitlin about how they are putting these practices to work and how Morningstar is implementing this governance and control measures within their organization. Now, let's talk about how this all will come together. As customers move from on-prem workloads to cloud, they're always worried about not being able to predict and budget their spend. They're shifting from fixed price model to pay-as-you-go model, and they are worried about overshooting their budget. While businesses continue to evolve, we hear customers always looking for ways to improve the predictability and visibility into the cloud cost. Cloud cost control and governance is much more than just how we avoid the billing surprise. It really requires us to think differently on how we budget, manage, and track our IT investments. We need to improve the way we forecast, predict, and budget our IT costs. We need to move away from the basic command and control mechanism, and we really need to think about how do we balance this agility with governance. We also need to ensure that we have the right account strategy, cost reporting mechanism, as well as cost allocation methods in place to provide the visibility in the spend across the entire organization. At the end of the day, we really need to drive a cultural transformation where there is cost awareness in every decision we make, whether there are service readiness reviews or architectural reviews we need to make sure there is cost-aware architectural choices being made. This is much more than just avoiding the cost surprises. We have a larger opportunity here about how we really modernize the governance and control at scale. How do we automate? How do we really move away from traditional command and control mechanisms? While cloud continues to be a change agent for the digital transformation, can it be a change agent also for the governance transformation? How do we make sure we are improving this, both the pace of innovation and agility, as well as the cost optimization? Now, let's talk about the speed of innovation and governance at scale. If you are responsible for defining the governance and policies within your organization and enforcing those policies. You may know it very well that, you know, the tension there is between really the control and the speed. 
If a builder has to go and work through the approval process before being able to access a particular resource he needs or she needs to be able to build, that is definitely going to slow down the pace of innovation. Now, too much governance and too much control could lead to decreased agility. So let me pause here and make sure I explain what I mean by governance and what I mean by control. Typically, when we are referring to governance, we are really talking about things like process definition or policies or procedures on how this technology is being consumed and who can consume it. Control, on the other hand, is really the implementation of these policies. Whether it is proactive or reactive, control operationalizes the governance. And like a lot of other things, this is a balance that we need to strike between the governance and control. And we need to make sure that it does not come at the expense of agility and the pace of innovation. The problem is really in the traditional technology consumption model, this is a zero sum game. When you are trying to improve agility, at that time you need to relax some of the governance and vice versa. In general, the governance has really been more of a manual process requiring human approvals and in reviews. It also is semi inconsistently applied across the organization. And it is a lot of time, it is a retroactive process. Most of all, this is a zero sum game. To get more of one, you need to give up more of some of the other one. And that is exactly what the traditional model does to us. However, with cloud, this notion of zero sum game has changed. What if we can automate governance and control so that builders can get the resources they need faster. At the same time, we have control in place so that they cannot overshoot the budget. With AWS, you can get visibility and tools you need to be able to effectively implement governance and controls without really slowing down the pace of innovation within your organization. But with all things in cloud, it requires a new mindset and a modern approach. Using the same manual, inconsistent, retroactive, reactive approach to cloud wouldn't really help in modern IT consumption. So today we will talk about a modern way to gain control over your cloud usage and also increase the predictability, compliance posture, cost efficiency, and visibility at scale. Now, as we dive deep, it is really important to understand that there is no one size fits all approach. We need to strike the right balance to make sure you are building a model that is appropriate for your specific organization. Some of the questions we need to think about that are you a startup where speed is everything or are you a large enterprise? Are you really new to the cloud or have you been operating at scale within cloud already? Do you have existing policies and governance that you are trying to apply and adapt to the new technology? Or are you really creating brand new policies for your cloud infrastructure? How much control do you want to place up front versus really reactively in re near real time? So some of those questions really help you answer and fine tune the model you build for your organization. And it's really important that each organization implement right level of governance and controls that are appropriate for your level of maturity, complexity, and scale. Now, evolving this cost control to be cloud native is the next step in this journey. To do this, there are, we need to think about you know, how we operate in cloud at scale. There are three building blocks that we'll talk about. First of all, govern and control. Second one is reporting and monitoring. And the third one is really cutting across both is automation. How do we implement these processes to achieve control at scale automatically? And that's where we will get to a point where we don't have to compromise with the speed of innovation while we are automating the controls. So we are going to dive deeper in these areas today. 
So let's jump right in. Now, we talked about governance and control starting with establishing the very basic guardrails. We have also talked to a number of CFOs and finance professionals. And while they are super excited about the business transformation and the agility that cloud brings to them, they are concerned about the billing surprises. So they want to make sure that there are guardrails in place so they are not slowing down the innovation, but at the same time, this innovation is in line and it's very consistent with their financial and business goals. So how do we establish such guardrails? Establishing guardrails is a process that starts with getting some of the basic answers right to some of the fundamental questions. Within your organization, who should have access to resources and what kind of resources? How do we ensure that resources and usage are really compliant with the policies within your organization? And with tens of thousands of accounts you might be managing, what is the right logical grouping of these accounts so that you can apply your policies in a way that it makes sense for your business? This all starts with having the right tools and right processes in place. And when it comes to processes, we need to adapt and augment the processes that have already existed within your organization. So when you are onboarding a brand new application or workload to the cloud, how do you ensure that each application is compliant with your organizational policies? We need to adapt the existing budgeting and forecasting processes to account for variable cost model that cloud is going to bring. When the, there are architectural reviews, we need to review it with the cost optimization lens. In a service readiness review, we need to make sure we are asking the right questions. For example, is the test environment shut down? Are the resource tags applied? Have budgets been created for this service? Do we have right thresholds in place for automating budget actions? Are these resources really appropriately sized? For the savings plan as well as reserve instances, do we have right balance between the on-demand spend and commitments in savings plan? Are these purchase orders ready to be executed? So all these questions, as you start gathering this information, it will prepare you to be able to set the right processes and tools in place to automate this. For the change management, we need to establish the clear ownership on who can make the changes, who can drive the approval, is it going to be automated or manual? What is the change management window? What are the rollback processes? And is there a scheduled follow-up for optimization activities? How about the incident management? Can we leverage the exist existing incident management system that you might have in your place for cost optimization. Can we trigger and resolve a spend anomaly event that with this existing incident management system? Can we do root cause analysis? Once you have these processes and checks in place, it is much easier to operationalize the governance. Once we have the right processes in place, we need to make sure that we have the right tools and technology to automate and scale the governance and control across the entire organization. Let's talk about some of the foundational services that AWS offers that can help you drive this control and compliance at scale. It starts by establishing some of the proactive controls. We need to define central policies that help ensure that right people have right access to the right resources. And there are two critical services that can help you to do just that. You might be familiar with AWS Identity and Access Manager. It really provides you granular control to manage your user across AWS services and resources, and you can set the permission on who can access what. For example, who can spin up or terminate a specific EC2 or RDS instances? 
who can read the content of a specific S3 bucket. So with identity and access management, you can specify the permission of control on which specific users can access which specific services, the type of actions they can take, and the resources they can utilize. For example, once you determine who has access to what, you can also make sure that you have CloudTrail enabled so that you can keep a track of all these activities and you can use it for audit purposes or for staying compliant. The second tool that you will need in this journey is really AWS organizations. So as customers grow and scale on AWS, they often look for ways to do better management of their accounts. The number of accounts continue to grow as they continue to scale on AWS. Now, customers may choose to group these accounts and organize them by development environment or in a different way that meets their security and compliance needs. What AWS organization does, it allows you to programmatically manage and create accounts. You can create groups of accounts, which are called organizational units, and then apply policies to these groups that centrally control the use of AWS resources down to the API level. By organizing accounts in an organizational units, you can apply service level control policy. You can also create targeted governance boundary for your organizational units. Once you have clarity on who can access what with the identity and access manager, and you have right grouping mechanism in place with AWS organization, the next step is to really lay out the automated deployment and provisioning. We need to think about how it can be self-service where we deploy all this multi-cloud environment automatically. AWS Control Tower will help you do that. If you are a customer with multiple AWS accounts and teams, cloud setup and governance could be complex and time consuming. It could slow down the very innovation you are trying to really speed up. What AWS Control Tower does, it really provides you an the easiest way to set up and govern a secure multi-cloud AWS environment called a landing zone. By implementing the AWS control tower, you can extend the governance into new or existing accounts and gain visibility into your compliance status very quickly. If you are building a new AWS environment, control tower will also help you get started quickly with built-in governance as well as best practices. Now let's talk about Landing Zone. Exactly what is it that Landing Zone covers? With the AWS Landing Zone, you will receive a baseline environment that gets you started with multi-account architecture, identity and access management, governance, security, network design, as well as logging. This solution is really built so that you can set up a new AWS environment very quickly. But it is also designed to scale for very large scale migrations. So now that we have talked about a set of proactive controls that you need to put in place to make sure you drive the right compliant usage at the start. Now let's talk about a set of things we might need to do reactively to make sure that these resources and accounts continue to stay compliant. So configuration compliance management is about verifying that your resource configuration complies with certain baseline procedures and best practices. And many of you might have experienced that, you know, certain operational and security practices within your organization need to be continuously checked and ensured that you know everybody is compliant to that. This tool allows you to define these policies for your cloud resources and alerts you in real time when any specific resource violates these policies. AWS Config is a native agentless AWS capability to discover resources in your account, to track the configuration changes, and maintain a history for up to seven years. It also evaluates 
configuration changes against the compliance policies and notifies you when there is a violation rule of this, any of these configuration rules. You can get an aggregated view of your resources and configuration and compliance status across many accounts in many regions. It also integrates with your own CMDB. It could be very well be service now. Now, it also has a certain powerful features like advanced query. It's a single query endpoint and a powerful query language to get your current resource data in this metadata without performing any specific API level calls. You could use even configuration aggregator to run the same query from central account across many accounts and regions. So now that we have really laid out some of the basic foundational groundwork for basic cost governance, let's talk about how do we get visibility and predictability in AWS spend and usage with help of reporting and monitoring. That will help us ensure that there are no cost surprises and innovation is in line with the broader business and financial goals. Again, it is a process that starts with getting some of these basics right. There are another set of questions we need to answer to make sure we get the right reporting and monitoring in place. So what is the right logical grouping within your organization of so that you can link the cost and usage of specific resources back to a specific team, service, or business unit. How do we ensure that we have the right safety net in place so that builders can continue to build without causing any cost surprises? Can we really prevent unintended spend automatically? What are the right spend and usage thresholds for various groups and services? How do we create really the hard spending limits so that nobody can overshoot the budget? Well, this process starts with billing console. We discussed how to establish the identity and access management and service control policies. What AWS Billing Console does is really make sure that you can help start apply this control specifically in a way who can view what resources as well as the bill. It will help you set up a system where who can see or do what. In the billing console, you can look across all of your accounts and resources in order to really understand and analyze your spend and usage patterns and trends. You could set rules or preferences on how you want to share these discounts across multiple accounts. You could also designate rules for logical grouping of cost and usage with help of cost categories. Additionally, you could also configure your billing and payment preferences or manage and track purchase orders. This is your way to start setting up some of the rules and guardrails across your organization. It should be the first stop in the cloud financial management to lay the groundwork before diving into specific services like Cost Explorer, Cost and Usage Report, or AWS Budgets. The next step in this journey is really being able to drive the culture of cost awareness and cost consciousness. We need to be able to tie this cost and usage back to specific teams, specific business units and services so that we can start driving the accountability. To do that, our goal is to really create a single source of truth, establish a uniform way for your business through cost reporting and metrics tracking. And AWS cost categories can help you do that. With cost categories, you can define custom grouping mechanism based on an account, a tag, specific service usage, or, or different charge types. And then this usage is automatically assigned to the categories that you have defined, whether that's specific teams, projects, or environment. You will see those category values flow through your cost and usage report and cost explorer, and you can see it reporting in a category. 
we have talked about tracking team specific spends. However, there might be even certain central IT costs that you cannot really tie back to one specific team, but you still need to share or distribute this cost across the organization. And some of these costs could be central costs like enterprise support cost or data transfer cost or operational cost for the central infrastructure team. Now, last August, we launched split charge rules within cost category, which allows you to allocate this cost across various teams. Users can choose to allocate, you know, based on various parameters. It could be even split, it could be fixed percentage split, it could also be proportional cost-based split. And you can spread this cost across the organization based on the criteria you define so that you are recovering this cost appropriately and driving accountability for those costs as well. With help of tagging and categorization, you can create a natural relationship between the costs and the businesses or the services that are incurring or resulting in that cost. And through this visibility, we can drive better cost awareness. We can drive better accountability across the organization. And we can help establish rational, informed cloud consumption model. Now let's discuss how we can predict and track cost and usage. The tool you need is AWS Budgets. AWS Budgets allows you to set custom budgets or thresholds that alert you when the cost or usage exceeds certain budgeted amount. You can also set the budget to alert you when it, it is likely to exceed the forecasted spend. For example, if you are at 80% utilization of the budget, then you want to get notified or you are exceeding the budget and you want to get notified. In addition to that, it also helps you set the reservation and savings plan utilization and coverage targets. So you will receive alerts whenever your savings plan utilization drops below certain threshold. You can also set and track budgets on a daily, monthly, quarterly or annual granularity. What really makes the AWS budgets powerful is that it integrates with many other AWS services. You could view and analyze what are the cost and usage drivers within your organization by integrating it with Cost Explorer. You could also get notifications in Slack or Chime by integrating it with AWS Chatbot. You could review the entire portfolio cost and you can review the entire portfolio and do the cost analysis with, by integrating it with service catalog. And this tool is free. There is really no reason to put this control in place, especially when you have this tool available and it's free. Now let's discuss how we can predict and track cost and usage. The tool you will need is AWS budgets. It lets you set custom budgets or thresholds that alert you when the cost or usage is likely to exceed your budgeted amount. You can also set budget on the forecasted spend. So for example, notify me when I am at 80% of my budgeted amount or notify me when I'm exceeding the budget. You can also use AWS budgets to set reservation and savings plan utilization and coverage thresholds. So you can receive alerts when your savings plan utilization is likely to drop below a specific threshold. You can also track it on a daily, monthly, annually, or quarterly granularities. What really makes this tool powerful is that it integrates with many other AWS services. For example, you can figure out and analyze what are the cost and usage drivers within your organization by integrating it with AWS Cost Explorer. You could also receive budget alerts in your Slack channel or Chime by integrating it with AWS Chatbot. You can track the cost on your approved AWS portfolio of products by integrating it with AWS Service Catalog. And this tool that really makes sure that you cannot overshoot your spend, this tool is free. You have no reason to not put controls in place, especially given that the tool is freely available. Now, while this tool is really helpful, what it does is notifies you 
And one of the things we hear from our customers is that alerts and notifications are great. But in order for me to be able to drive change and instill control on my bill, I really need something that's more than just a notification. I need to be able to act and I need to be able to do it at scale. So last October, we launched AWS Budget Actions that helps you do just that. The budget actions allows you to configure actions that can be automatically executed once a budget threshold has been reached. So, and you may choose to take these actions automatically or you might have your own change management process and approval workflow that we can take, go through. These actions can also apply your IAM policies as well as service control policies to users, groups, roles, or organizational units to make sure you can prevent the further provisioning of resources once you hit a threshold. You could also choose to take simple actions like you know, stop running this EC2 instance or an RDS instance once you hit a threshold. This has been a really powerful solution for our customers, not only because they can control the cost, but can also help reinforce your IAM and service control policies. Budget actions will help you ensure that your spend is consistent with your finance and business goals. Now, we have been discussing this where this is all about user-defined thresholds. You are defining what is the right usage threshold and the spend threshold for certain services, users, what if there is an unintended spend that is still within the threshold? How do we capture that spend anomaly? So how do we really pick up a specific spend that is not user-defined? And not all surprises are created equal. There are good surprises that became under budget, awesome. And there are surprises that we wish we didn't have to deal with. Thinking of the socks I got last Christmas. Now let's consider a couple of scenarios. First, imagine a scenario where we exceeded the budget because our business is growing and our customers are scaling much faster than we anticipated. Is that okay? Of course. Now consider another scenario where we are spending below the budget. So ideally we shouldn't have anything to worry about, but we still need to think about an unintended spend. It could very well be a long running database query that should have been avoided. This may not trigger an alert through AWS budgets, but this is still unintended and unexpected spend that we want to prevent. We need to not only avoid exceeding budgets, but we also need to avoid any unintended spend. So how do we figure out what is intended versus unintended spend? For that, we need a lot more contextualized understanding of what is normal and abnormal for your business. We need to understand your usage and spend patterns and need to figure out what is normal spend looking like? What is abnormal spend? And what is the normal usage versus abnormal usage? And that's the exit idea behind AWS cost anomaly detection. Last year at reInvent, we launched, launched AWS cost anomaly detection, which is a machine learning backed service to proactively detect cost and usage anomalies. These anomalies are really contextualized for each and every customer based on your own spending patterns. And the ML-based models continue to monitor your spend and usage continuously and notify you when something is abnormal. In addition to alerting, it will also provide you ability to do root cause analysis so that you can resolve the quick issue quickly and you can prevent the unintended spend. And despite being powered by this sophisticated machine learning technology, it does not really require you to do any deep learning. It's just three clicks, super easy to configure. 
in layout. And perhaps just as compelling is that it's free. So there is really no reason for you to not try it out. So I'm gonna pause and take a step back and talk about, we discussed how to define and establish the basic guardrails and policies. What are the practices to implement? And what are the tools that can help you implement and automate your governance and controls at scale? With these policies, practices, and tools implementation, you can be rest assured that your builders can continue to build and innovate without really co causing any cost surprises. This is the modern way of automating control and governance at scale without compromising on speed of innovation. With this, let me hand it over to Caitlin. She will walk us through Morningstar's journey in establishing this cost control and governance while growing their business on AWS. Caitlin. Thank you, Bina. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Caitlin DeCraney, and I am the Senior Cloud Finance Manager at Morningstar. And I am here to talk to you guys a little bit about our journey establishing cost controls and governance in public cloud with AWS. So before I get started, I just want to um, go over and give a little bit of background about Morningstar for those of you who might not be familiar. Uh, we are a leading provider of independent investment research in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. We leverage our core competencies in data and research to create products that empower investors. That's our mission. We have almost just a little shy of 8,000 employees and operate in 29 countries globally. So our public cloud journey, I'll give you guys a little bit of background. Uh, we began our journey in 2017 and at the time we had a very small presence. We only had one product team that was active in AWS and we had less than 20 accounts. Uh, in addition, we had a center of excellence, which was made up of representatives from different parts of the business that includes product, technology, and finance. And together, um, the COE, which I was a part of, established our vision and goals for leveraging public cloud that would enable us to move nimbly into the future, which are depicted here. So since our cloud journey, uh, we've made some pro quite some progress to date. Uh, we have performed nine data center migrations. Six of those are complete. Three of them are still in progress. We've uh, migrated over 5,000 servers um, on-prem globally, and we have over 1,000 accounts active in AWS. In addition to that, our COE has evolved and um, become a full-time dedicated cloud services team, which I am a part of. This team also has several other squads, um, which includes security, operations, and infrastructure as well. And our team is responsible for providing technical guidance and guard, uh, controls and guardrails um, to enable teams across Morningstar to be successful in public cloud. So when we began our journey, we recognized that we had a need for cost management early on, and that would be an important piece. Um, but we really didn't understand what that would mean, and that does not mean that we didn't have our challenges. Uh, as we began onboarding more teams, our spend began to grow, and so did the surprises. I think one of the uh, defining moments looking back was um, one moment we had a runaway Lambda um, that took off over the weekend and ended up racking up $30,000 in charges just in one weekend alone. Uh, our team was in awe, especially me. And I think at that moment, that's where we realized just how quickly spend can get out of control and how material it is well. Another thing that we struggled with was when uh, we were working with the teams to try and pinpoint and identify what happened and um, the right point of contact to get some more information. That was challenging because it was hard to you know, communicate with technologists and finance and finding a common language. So that was one um, really big challenge we had. And then in addition, we had a tagging strategy in place um, and uh, in standards, but we didn't have a mechanism to enforce it. So lack of um, compliance with that also made it very difficult. Um, so it was moments like these that, while they were painful, there were fundamental lessons that really helped us shape the, shape the governance and controls that we have in place today. Um, so what does FinOps look like at Morningstar? Um, I'll start with the people aspect of that. 
one of the first things that we did was we established a cloud financial governance committee. And this is made up of several key stakeholders from various functions and roles across the organization. And they play an integral, integral role in FinOps. We knew that in order for um, cloud governance and um, controls that we put in place to be successful, we needed to have alignment and sponsorship from all these stakeholders. That was critical. Um, this committee is responsible for ensuring strategic success, strategic alignment and financial success in the adoption of public cloud and meets monthly. The next uh, key change uh, with FinOps is processes. So in order to enable teams um, to be able to, you know, with, with speed and innovation while also managing costs, we knew that the current existing processes we had in place needed to be augmented. So a couple of big things that we did at Morningstar. Um, the first thing was we manage the public cloud budget centrally, and we do a showback model at various dimensions, which I'll go into more detail in a couple slides. We um, adopted a more agile approach to budgeting and forecasting because we knew that it was not realistic to do all of that um, planning in the fall with the typical cycle. Uh, as a result, what we did was we had business units um, were given a set amount of funds and then we also set aside a reserve pool, which would be released as needed throughout the year and governed by the governance committee. The next two big changes we did were established a standardized process that teams follow um, that was required before going live in public cloud in AWS. So that as well, um, it includes the completion of a business case and a finance and architecture review. The business case requirement was uh, really around focusing and documenting key assumptions, making sure that we had the business uh, value and strategic alignment documented. If the application or initiative was being migrated from on-prem to AWS, we had a TCO analysis as well in there. The finance and architecture review was really established to make sure that uh, teams were officially using public cloud and that they were um, using architecturally sound, um, their applications were architecturally sound and aligned with Morningstar standards. And from a finance standpoint, sitting in with these meetings with architecture, um, with our architecture um, professionals internally really has helped um, us get better at estimating because we are we have more comfort around the architecture and that we're capturing all the costs. It's enabled us to be more proactive about cost optimization because I can catch things in the beginning when reviewing that with teams. Um, it's also increased accuracy of estimations. And most importantly, these have given us a set to find benchmarks so that we can measure and track spend against. So in order to actually monitor, report, and respond to actual spend, we needed to be able to report our spend in a meaningful way that correlates to these business cases. Um, and after that, we have to get the information to the appropriate stakeholders to be able to act. So before I go into some of the tools that we use in order to monitor, report, and respond, I'm going to just give you guys a little bit of background about our account structure so that will help, helpfully help make um, put it all together. Um, I have a diagram over here um, that shows our account structure, which is actually, it was security driven, the decision to do a team-based account structure. So each team has two accounts, a prod and non-prod account. So those two accounts together will roll up to one team. And then there are multiple teams that work up under each business unit. All the business units combined will then roll up under our entire organization and you get Morningstar total. Um, below the teams is where the business cases are submitted and these are at the initiative level. So the um, tools that we use for, it, for on AWS side is AWS cost categories to be able to map the accounts up to the team level, then to the PL level, and then to the overall business unit level. So I have an example here. If there's a team core services, we use the cost categories, um, the account dimension to map the prod and non-prod account together to be able to report core services team total spend. That is also done then um, to roll up business units and categorize um, teams and accounts accordingly as well. To get more granularity in terms of actual spend and down to the initial level, we use cost allocation tags. Um, teams will have 
different initiatives that are going on. Not It doesn't necessarily mean that one team just has one initiative. There could be various ones initiatives being worked on at one time. So that's where it's important for us to be able to use cost allocation tags to tag resources with the initiative business case name so that we can get down to that granularity. Um, putting it all together, kind of an example here. So um, the first, um, you'll see Team A has three initiatives that are active and going on. Each initiative is uh, represents a business case. So each business case totals up, their budget would be 80K. Um, team A and Team B together represent business unit one. So their, the sum of their budget is the budget of business unit one. Um, in addition, we also utilize cost allocation tags to track larger project initiatives uh, that are going on across the company. So for example, we might have a data center migration and that is um, made up of you know, various teams. It's not P&L or business unit or team specific. So we use cost allocation tags as well to be able to track teams at um, budget at the project level across multiple initiatives and across multiple P&Ls. So going into a little more detail about cost allocation tags, um, going back to my story when we kind of first started our journey, we had a strategy that was in place, but that's not helpful when there's no um, when it's not being followed and there's no way to enforce it. So something that we've done at Morningstar is we utilized existing processes in place to enforce cost allocation tags and compliance. What we've done is we've utilized product scorecards, and these are essentially um, scorecards that are sent out to the technology teams on a weekly basis that are rating them and their applications, risk level, and overall health. So that means checking on basic security posture, um, product disaster recovery, and basic operational readiness as well. So these um, different checks in different areas, all they get a rating for each of them, and then they get an overall rating based on a methodology um, that takes into account the ratings for each of those individual components. These are heavily um, reviewed and monitored across the organization. So it was a great opportunity for us to take something new for the technology side and integrate it into existing processes. So what we do is we use um, AWS, we use our scanning to cut JIRA tickets to identify resources that are not compliant or missing tags um, to help us to um, enforce um, and enforce compliance. And it, when we first integrated this, um, one of the things, service ID, which is very helpful for us going back to be able to track costs at a product level, um, our cost allocation tag coverage increased 7% within just the first three months. So it's been very successful. So now that we have a benchmark to mat, um, something to benchmark spend against, a tagging strategy that enables us to actually take actual spend and measure that against the benchmarks, and then a way to enforce it to make sure that we actually um, can get the appropriate data. The next thing is being able to monitor, report, and respond. So at Morningstar, we utilize AWS budgets and, and budget reports to confirm that spend is tracking to what we had planned originally, uh, receive alerts, when spend is either approaching or it's projected to exceed what the original plan was, and then to make sure that we can get the right information into the right hands of the right stakeholders to be able to take action when needed. Um, one example specifically with cost budgets, um, we create cost budgets that are managed centrally by cloud services team um, at three various dimensions. And we do this leveraging what I just spoke about using AWS cost categories and cost allocation tags to be able to create these reports and um, put together the meaningful information and then get that to the right stakeholder. These standard reports are sent out typically on a weekly basis. Um, and we have two standardized alerting thresholds that we have configured um, that we use across the organization as a percentage of actual spend and a percentage of forecasted spend. Um, we also enable teams to be able to set up their own custom alerts in their accounts as well so that they can um, you know, be alerted if they feel like they want different thresholds or um, want to monitor specific services or anything else that would be helpful for them. 
The next thing that I want to talk about, um, and I've been really impressed, and I think it's an incredible tool, is AWS Cost Anomaly Detection. Um, at Morningstar, uh, this pa past couple months, um, this year, we focused really around um, doing a POC and exploring this new this tool. And um, it's just been amazing to see all the different anomalies that kind of pop up that could easily be mis mistook as, you know, ramp up and spend from a team migrating, but really is a runaway cost. And I'll go into a little more detail here. Uh, so what we did was um, at the cloud services team, we set up a POC and we used the AWS services monitor in the AWS cost anomaly detection um, service. And we set it up at the master payer account. We started uh, with low thresholds and kind of played around with this for a little bit, just based on what our results were. And what our POC looked like was we set an alert threshold. We had the emails that when the threshold was triggered would be sent to cloud services. I would look over it from a finance standpoint and investigate from based on the knowledge that I knew. If appropriate, um, further action was needed, I would follow it to the developer engineer team and then um, they would review it and we would give the feedback back into the console. So I'll walk through one example. We have many of these, but um, one example was we had an EFS cleanup job that failed to schedule. So we received an alert um, in the email. That's the first picture that we have here. And with a max daily impact of $170 for a specific account, um, we forwarded this alert to the team, and then after further investigation, realized that there was a cleanup job, like I said, that had failed to execute, and you can see that it was steadily um, causing an increase in EFS costs. Um, then after the team realized this, they were able to fix the job, and um, going forward, they were able to set up a CloudWatch monitor to make sure that they were, um, you know, we could prevent this from happening in the future. So in the last uh, picture snippet, you can see the remediation and the impact that it had. And this is just one example of many that we've uh, been able to find with this cool tool. So what, um, I guess, are the results here? Um, I think the biggest takeaways is that FinOps at Morningstar and putting in controls, cost controls and governance has really helped establish a cost control culture. Um, developers and technologists are a lot more proactive reaching out to me about budgets, which has been really great to see. Um, in addition, this has also really enhanced collaboration and communication and transparency across business units, um, which has been really helpful in making sure that we're all aligned in meeting our business objectives at Morningstar. Um, some other kind of data points in terms of how this has really helped us you know, be more efficient and try to help strike a balance between innovation and cost controls is the average number of architecture review sessions um, typically would go on for weeks and teams would have to come back and attend at least three. Now most of them are um, only attending one and they have all the information that they need ready. And um, the last thing, budget versus actuals, we were really bad at estimating. We overestimated, which some might think is a good problem to have, but at the same time, that means that we were losing out on investing money and other opportunities for the business. So uh, when we started out in 2018, we were 36% favorable. And then last year we were 13% favorable. So we've gotten a lot better at estimating as a result. Things that I wish I knew when I started this journey. Um, the first thing, embrace Agile. Um, in order to you know, fully utilize the benefits of public cloud, you need to adopt, adopt an Agile mind frame. This was something that was new to me from, as, from a finance standpoint. Um, and I really think it's critical and important to be able to be successful when controlling costs and governing um, in the cloud. The um, next thing is make sure you implement a, and enforce a tagging strategy early. We had a tracking strategy, as I said, that we defined the standards and we put it out there, but um, the enforcement came later down the road and the, you know, the quicker you get ahead of it, um, the better it'll be. And the third recommendation is just automate, automate, automate. This is, I think, the only way that you can survive at scale in the cloud. And that's all I have for today. I will hand it back off to Bina um, and she'll go over a little more information for you guys before you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. Before you go, let me share some of the resources that you can leverage to learn and connect with your peers. We have, we have Peer Connect event where you can come and hear what other customers are sharing. 
and learn about their implementation of cost control and governance at scale. We also have cloud financial management kiosk here in our expo hall. Please do stop by, say hello to our team members, as well as see some of the product demos. We have cloud financial management blog where we continue to share about the new innovation we are launching in this space. Additionally, we have four more sessions related to cloud financial management here in this reInvent. Please do stop by in these sessions. It includes you know, eight ways to control and manage the AWS spend or unit, unit metrics in practice, strategic IT planning and evolution, as well as quantifying and maximizing your cloud business value. So uh, thanks again, really happy that you all joined here and I hope you found the value and I hope you really optimize your spend on AWS and continue to let the builders build.